Casey and Raymond are going to sit up here in these blue chairs, and we're going to tell lies. Tell lies. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to ask questions and have a little repartee, a conversation with Raymond Brockstein. So thank you all for being here, and here's Karen. Thank you, Barry. It's November, it's almost the end of the year, so at this dinner last year, I was having a nice time, time and someone said, we think you're going to be the new chair of the Young Architects Committee. Congratulations! So anyway, it's been a great year and we've enjoyed it and we've had the support. Tonight's, tonight's about the Connect dinner and really you connect with us as Young Architects and we connect with you when we need advice, need guidance. And we're always needing advice and guidance, and we're always trying to connect with you. So there's some fellows in particular that helped us out with our programs this year. Greg Roberts, Barry Moore, Donna Kakmar, Nanya Grenader, Danny Samuels, Kathleen English, and Raymond Brockstein. Thank you. And there's still next year. Bill Stern, I'm looking at you. What can we, what can, where can you take us? <laughs> so um, I'd actually like to thank Barry Scardino, and Courtney Tutt this year, who is, they're indispensable, invaluable, wonderful. They make it all happen behind the scenes. A lot of emails go back and forth to make all of these events happen. And we volunteer and they sort of piece it all together. Um, and we have a new chair. I've sort of done the same thing that happened to me. I've accosted a, <laughs> a new person. Noe, Noe Ramirez, where are you? In the back, Noe will be the new young architect chair next year. Thank you, Noe. And he has a new little baby, so it makes it even more special that he's going to donate his, dedicate his time to the AIA, but I promised him I would help. Um, a reminder, the AIA holiday party is coming up, um, honoring Arthur Jones at the MFA, so if you haven't signed up, please do. It's December 7th. So tonight, there is a reason why we're having Raymond Brockstein other than he's just a really cool guy. But my husband, Andy, and I have gone on several of the Rice Design Alliance trips to different cities, the hometown tours. And Susan and Raymond have also gone on a lot of these tours. And part of going on and seeing architecture in, in great places of the world is having great dinners, like tonight, and having some cocktails. And part of it with Raymond and Susan is telling great stories. So I've been really fortunate to sit with Raymond and Susan in Paris, Chicago, you know, lots of different places and just hear them talk. And I felt like a lot of the young architects didn't have that benefit to hear Raymond's great stories. Like the night Frank Lloyd Wright came to town and he stopped him at the hotel, at the, at the Shamrock Hotel and got invited up to his room and, and, and talked all night. You've got to get that out of him. So there's some really great stories that I hope he'll share. And, and you guys know Raymond, the fellows, you know, and the new architects. I want you to know Raymond that way that I know Raymond. So with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, Raymond Brockstein. Don't believe it. <laughs> How are we going to start this anyway? We have a table, so why don't we start with Brian, your table. What's your table? Sally Walsh. Sally Walsh. Do you have a question? About Sally Walsh. About Sally Walsh. Actually, Raymond, can you talk about, um, I, I actually did not even notice that you, you created the Sally Walsh lecture series, that idea. Can you talk about that? I did. I, the, the question was about Sally Walsh and the Sally Walsh Lecture Series and that I created and yes I created it and yes I twisted uh, some arms of some very wealthy friends of hers to endow enough to have this lecture series happen. Um, <clears throat> Sally I think arguably is the person that brought modern design to interior design in Houston and she ended up here 
probably by accident anyway, because she married a guy, a lawyer, uh, Bill Walsh, who was a, uh, stationed at Ellington Field, and that's how Sally ended up in Houston. And uh, Bill Walsh was an alcoholic, a womanizer, <laughs> Good and a criminal <laughs> lawyer who worked for Percy Foreman <laughs> and charismatic and um, anyway and so uh, Sally uh, ended up here and uh, started a business with uh, Jack Evans which was called Evans Walsh and they had a logo with, which was sort of a, a circular shaped E and a circular shaped W, which uh, good old Jack Evans went after they split up and he, and he decided to take in Bruce Monocle, he turned over the, the W and made an M out of it so he didn't have to buy a new sign for the shop. Which gives you a little insight into Jack. Um, Sally was uh, came from modest means. Her father was a uh, mining engineer. And anyway, long story short, short grew up in South Dakota. Uh, both her parents were fairly sophisticated and educated. And um, at some point, um, she needed a job. They couldn't afford to send her to college. And uh, she ended up going to Chicago from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, there was, I, I don't know whether it was an ad in the paper or what, but somehow she ended up getting a job with Noel uh, in Chicago, because Noel had a, a showroom in the merchandise mart. And uh, she didn't know anything about design. I mean, nothing. And she ended up being taught designed by Hans Noel, which ain't all bad. <laughs> I've seen worse. And um, so she, and she told stories about this. I mean, I, it's, it, she told a story of, of having secured a really plum of a contract to do an interior for a bank in Milwaukee. And she was in charge of it and she, selected the furniture and she selected the fabrics and she selected she she selected the colors and they finished the job and the bankers were very uh, upset about it because they thought the colors were terrible and they called Hans Snow who was in the showroom in New York and told him they were really unhappy and so he needed to come and look at this thing, and so he flies into Chicago, and Sally is telling me this. And they both get on a plane, they fly to Milwaukee, they take a cab to the bank, and the banker is there and greets them, and Hans walks into the banking lobby, and he's looking around, and he says, Oh, fantastic, magnificent. I have never seen anything like this. This is the most fabulous interior that we have ever done. The colors are unbelievable. And the bankers are kind of saying, are you really serious? Oh, yes, yes, fabulous. So uh, Sally is beaming. And uh, the bankers say, OK, well, maybe we just are not accustomed to this. And they said, fine, we'll accept it. So. Sally and Hans go back down to the street. They get a cab to go to the airport. She says, the minute they close the door to the cab, Hans says, don't you ever use those colors again. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, that was the beginning of her white and beige and gray period. <laughs> but um, she ended up here and uh, I had not met her, and I was, I was intimidated by her reputation. And uh, Mac Wingfield is the person that actually got us together because she had done the first Transco building uh, in the Galleria, and uh, they had used 
some furniture, I can't remember the furniture manufacturer, but there were some problems with it. And so Max said she ought to get together with me and Mac called us and set up a meeting and we got together and we looked at it and, and actually what was happening, it was sagging or something and it, all it was was they had put the levelers for these cabinets, it was an open office system, one of the first, they put the levelers in, the, in a place where it caused the, the cabinets to sag and if you put the levelers on another component they wouldn't and I told her that and you know what, that's all it took from then on, I could do no wrong. <laughs> And um, she said, God, I wished you would have gotten involved with me before. And I said, well, I would have, but I was kind of intimidated by your reputation. Why didn't you call me? She says, well, I'm kind of intimidated by your reputation. <laughs> but um, we had a great relationship, and she taught me a lot. Um, I have never met a person who, who could handle the politics of getting work like she could and she's talking about people and she's always using first names and she's telling calls me up and she said we got to go to this luncheon for jimmy i said who the hell is jimmy it was james baker and sally is a is a liberal democrat lassoing me into going to a luncheon to support john tower <laughs> So that gives you a little bit of insight. But um, and, and yeah, she was just an incredible person. It had to be perfect. She, she believed in good design. And there, at one point when she was in Chicago, she had tried to talk Sears into making a line of modern furniture for just the people who bought Sears furniture, which she could never talk them into. But she thought, Good design was not necessarily expensive design. And then Cy Morris sells a job to Gulf Oil Chemicals, and he comes back and he calls Sally into his office and he says, we're doing this job. She says, great, great, great. And he says, and it's gotta be colonial. And she says, we don't do colonial. And he says, yes, we do do colonial. <laughs> and I get a call. What are you doing next Tuesday? I said, I don't know, what, what do you got in mind? We're going to Charlottesville. I said, we are? Yes. And you're, gonna, you're going to look at all the woodwork at Monticello, and I'm gonna look at the design of what Jefferson did. If we're gonna do colonial, we by God are gonna do real colonial. And we by golly got into Monticello uh, early in the morning one day before the tourists, and we got every, we, you know, we looked at everything we needed to look at. And I made sketches of all the profiles of the, the cabinetry and the woodwork and so forth. And she ended up designing a space that used the colonial uh, motif, so to speak, but in a very contemporary modern way. And so that was her genius. She was just a, a very talented person. And she actually, I did things I never thought we could do because of her. Because she'd come out and we had an old metal worker and uh, she would bond with the guys in the shop. I'll never forget it. She goes out there one day and she, she wants this piece out of metal. It was a complex piece. And she says, Mr. Becker, can you do it? And he says, lady, if it ain't born or hatched, we can build it. <laughs> so anyway, that gave you some little, gives, gives us a little bit of insight into Sally. Next table, John, Rusty, Rusty's got his hand up, Rusty. Uh, uh, oh, I thought you'd get to us later, but. No, uh, you're. I want to hear the food. <laughs> we, we know you've worked with every famous architect you can imagine. We're the famous architect too. Okay. So Karen alluded to the Frank Lord Wright story, so we want to hear that. But we also want to hear. All right, I'll later. tell you all the poop. What? what they aren't. They, they aren't any different than you are. They just got better PR. <laughs> 
talent, talent doesn't know any boundaries. Well, uh, the first, probably, Wright was probably the first really great architect that I had, had been exposed to, and he came to Houston for an AI meeting, and I, he was receiving some kind of a, an award, and I don't recall what it was. Not at a not at a chapter meeting. Was it? Okay. Well. Okay. We this was this was at the Houston Country Club when the Houston Country Club was on Wayside Drive. <laughs> There's probably nobody but but three of us in here that were alive then. And. And, and, uh, and, and Andy Todd urged and arranged for us students to come to the meeting so we could interact with Wright. And he had said, look, uh, Wright doesn't give a damn about the practitioners. He cares about students. Well, we, we all showed up. And you couldn't get near him. I mean, the practitioners, everybody was, was crowding around him. And so uh, he got up and he... And he made a talk, I'll never forget, because in those days, it was before Intercontinental Airport, and the only airport we have is where Hobby is, and we're waiting for these great words of wisdom, and he gets up and he starts talking, and he said, you know, the ride in from the airport was one of the ugliest rides I've, I've experienced, because you guys have got telephone poles with, or, or electric poles, utility poles with wires all over the place and it's really ugly why don't you put them underground <laughs> and so we're and, and i remember talking to andy and saying well, we can't even get near him so he says well he'll leave early follow him <laughs> i said follow him tail frank lloyd right yeah and you go in the hotel and you Talk to him, and I would have never done it. And um, but we did, and I can't remember. I think there were three of us, but I only remember Brewer Ben Brewer being one of, with me. So they took him back to the hotel, to the Shamrock Hotel, and um, we they let him off, and we dashed in, and he was he'd gone up to the desk to get his. Um, key and he was heading for the elevator and we accosted him in the lobby and we said, Mr. Wright and he said, yeah, and he said, we're, we're, archi we're architecture students and he said, well, what do you guys want? And I said, we said, well, we just want to talk to you. And he said, okay, come on up to the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we came up to the room and I guess we had about an hour or so with him and he is the only architect I have ever met in my entire life who, who acknowledged having been born an architect. <laughs> Did not hesitate to say, I didn't learn it, I wasn't taught it, I was born it. <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time talking to us. The essence of, of that conversation was to, as he put it, get your hands in the mud. Learn what it is like to build a building. And uh, so it was, it was a very interesting encounter, and that was my Frank Lloyd Wright story. Uh, the second great architect I was exposed to was, was Meese, who Andy arranged to bring to Rice to talk to our class, which, yeah, which, which uh, our class probably might have been the most politically adept, but certainly not the most talented <laughs> design group, but Mies was, uh, Mies was, was very interesting, he had an accent you could cut with a knife, it was that thick, but, um, and I remember him talking about having been apprenticed to um, a firm that made, as he put it, stucco, which is uh, plaster decorations, uh, classic 
decorations that you, we still do it, paste on buildings. Um, and the other thing I remember about Wright, and I'm not sure he said it, but, but Andy might have said it, is, you know, as good a designer as he was, the, the idea of, of really good design is not always something that comes so easy, even to the most talented. And um, I remember having been told that when he designed the Barcelona chair, that he had a little storeroom and it was full of Barcelona chairs. Huh? 54 of them. He, yeah, because it, he, he didn't get it right the first time. We don't always get it right the first time, but the difference between a good designer and others is a good designer never stops until it's as perfect as it can be. And so it never comes easy. Um, I have known Philip Johnson, uh, who asked uh, me to help uh, with some of the cabinet work that was going to be involved in the remodeling of the Carter Museum and there was and, and it was way over budget like everything he was doing in those days and, uh, so there was a big meeting called in uh, Fort Worth about the addition and how to get it in budget and I, th I think the, the contractor Thomas Byrne if I remember and so I had to fly up there, and uh, the room is full of people. I mean, it, it every subcontractor, and Philip is there, and the contractor is there, and Mrs. Johnson, who was Eamon Carter's daughter, who was paying for all this, was there. And I, he may have designed her house, I'm not sure, but I know that when he went to Fort Worth, that's where he stayed. It just was by coincidence that she married someone who was also a Johnson. And so the stone work was one of the big problems and they wanted to change the stone and Philip got up and he started talking about why they couldn't change the stone and on and on and on and on and finally Mrs. Johnson is sitting there in the corner and finally she says, Philip! And he looks up and she says, sit down. <laughs> and uh, I took him to the airport because we were both on a flight about the same time. And I said, Mr. Johnson, that was terrible. And he said, no, I and he started laughing about it. He just thought it was the funniest thing that ever happened because he was going to push the envelope until he got his way if he could. So that was Philip. And I, and I had done work for him through the years. And, some of the, he was, on the surface, some of the, the really well-known architects appear to be different than they are, but I found most of them really are, are very decent people who really care about what they're doing and they want it to be right. And so it, sometimes they, they come across as difficult or egocentric uh, we did the, a huge amount of work in the Getty Museum in uh, Los Angeles for Richard Meyer, who is notoriously known as uh, quite egocentric. And, uh, but Richard wanted it to be right. And, I remember getting a telephone call. They said, Richard Meyer is calling you. I said, oh God, we're in deep, deep trouble. And I didn't want to take the call, but you can't not take the call. And it turned out, he just wanted to ask a question about some woodwork and he wanted to, to know what, what was the, the cleanest, most perfect white oak you could buy because he wanted to do all the galleries in the museum part of the Getty in oak. And uh, 
I said, well, Mr. Meyer, the, the finest white oak that I know of is it grows in southern Germany and it grows in the Spessard region, only in that region. But it's extremely expensive and most of that, most of those logs are very, very large. And the German government requires the, the, the people doing forestry to get a permit to cut a tree down. And not just several trees, but each tree in that forest. And you get the permit and you have to plant two trees for every tree you take down. And so most of those trees are cut into veneer because it's very, it's much more profitable if you can cut uh, an inch thick board into 50 pieces, you get 50 times more than you would. And I said, I don't know whether you, you know, this, this is really expensive stuff if you want to use it for, for trim, which he wanted to use it for baseboard, header trim, and jams at openings and all of that. And I said, I can't believe you could do that on a solid white oak from Germany. Anyway, long story short, that's where we did it from. <laughs> but after that, uh, it was interesting because I could call Richard Meyer if I wanted, we, I wanted to introduce him to some of the younger people in our firm and he was extraordinarily uh, generous with his time and we went to New York and he said, no, come on, come on over to the RF office and he spent about an hour talking to our people. So there is another side to these, to these guys who are, who are really well known. Uh, in addition to the day when he made him move a, a palm tree two feet in a courtyard in the offices of the Getty because it wasn't in the right place. <laughs> but, um, and I've done work for, we did some work for Charlie Guathme who, who was very much the same. Once you, you got to know him and you worked with him, they're very decent people and, and they were very nice to me. Um, so that's my insight into the quote, great architects. <laughs> Next table, where's a hand? Oh, Nanya. Thank you, because it's cut the waste management cost. <laughs> you, you don't realize. <laughs> we appreciate that. But you're at the education table. And um, is there a question? Well, Andy should be the one to ask the question. Oh, God help me. <laughs> I Well, Andy is... Andy is the reason that I'm here. Uh oh. Now, who gets to play? Yes, you get the you get the credit and you get the blame. Um, no, it, it, if you are fortunate 
to have a mentor <coughs> in your life, it, it makes a big difference. And, and I have been fortunate to have uh, a few mentors, Andy probably being the, thank you, the, 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 the most significant because I got to tell you, when I arrived at Rice in the, in the architecture department, I thought I knew what I was getting into because I had taken mechanical drawing in junior high school, so I certainly was well equipped to be an architect. And uh, <laughs> my God. Uh, and and the, the first thing we did, one of the first things, we, we made stretches. And how many in here know what a stretch is? Yeah, not many. And uh, it's, well, it, it, in the Beaux-Arts, educational uh, approach and Beaux-Arts architects rendered in watercolor a lot, watercolor and ink. And, uh, when you're working with watercolor, the, the paper expands when it gets wet, and it wrinkles and so forth. And so what we were taught was you soak the paper until it's totally absorbed, f full of water, you stretch it around a board, you have paste on the back side, you put the, the adhesive on, you stretch it, and you let it dry, and when it dries, it dries really, really tight, and so that when you use watercolor, it doesn't wrinkle up, which hadn't been a big help to me. <laughs> <laughs> Other than it makes a good story. But I arrived at Rice at the end of, uh, uh, really toward the end of the Beaux-Arts uh, approach to education. Uh, William Ward Watkin was still alive, but uh, James Chilman and, and James Moorhead were running the Department of Architecture. And so Andy was the first modernist, really, uh, on the faculty. And I recall at that point, uh, the University of Houston School of Architecture really was far ahead of us when it came to modern design because Howard Barnstone was there and Verdette was there. And we had Andy, thank God. And um, Andy uh, didn't give up on us. And, <laughs> and, and he had good reason to, he would have had good reason to, I mean, I was just basically a sloppy kid, and uh, I, I you know, my idea was you take an assignment, you get it done, you turn it in, and get the hell out of there. And Andy taught me that isn't the way it's done, and it made a big difference in my life. Uh, I, I I understand it now a lot more than I did then. But um, education is, is what makes, makes us into, to, makes architects. And uh, I was very, very lucky because um, Andy got promoted when we got promoted from freshman to sophomore. <laughs> and uh, so we had him a second year. And then we went on through and we got our degree. And, went into our graduate year for our second degree and he got promoted to teach the graduate year so we had the unfortunate experience of having three out of five years <laughs> with a with a professor who if if he got irritated at what you were doing might not give you a crit for three months which didn't help grades. <laughs> but I owe a lot to Andy and I always will because I would never, whatever I have achieved, I owe a lot of it to being fortunate enough to have a professor who really did care. And that's our obligation. We all need to care about those who are coming behind us because they have to build on what we have provided.
Yes, I did teach them French, especially this is one of them right here. Tuesday of every week of our lives. Not because of us, it's because somebody called Sally Walsh. If she didn't get me, she'd get him. And whatever she could get out of me, she used on him and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you don't know what his nickname was, he's the bear. <laughs> that doesn't quite describe him. <clears throat> One of the people, well, I might as well tell you. But anyway, <laughs> Bud Moorhead, as he's called, I used to call him Mr. Andy. <laughs> Bud Moorhead had a book about that thick. <laughs> <laughs> it that and that red. And you had every student had to I want to tell the story. You tell it. You tell it. It was forty dollars. Yes, today I'm not joking. That would be three or four hundred dollars. And it was called something about descriptive geometry, and then you used that to go into drawing perspective. And one day, it wasn't unusual. Raymond got out and said, "Mr. Boyd, whose education in architecture was quite sparse." <laughs> And he said that Mr. Moyer, unusually polite, why do we have to spend five hours drawing perspective to this descriptive John Dewey and this beautiful book that we have to pay for the answer when we have a member of the faculty who does the same thing in 15 minutes or less? Long silence. <coughs> Didn't go very well, Mr. Sparse, education Moyer. He came in the faculty morning, the next morning, and he said, somebody we have to get rid of. We can't have him. He's rude. This man I'm telling you about, he's a man called Brockstein. He's rude. He's rude. Noisy. Loud. All of that. <laughs> Thoroughly objectionable and completely disruptive. I'm sitting here, I've heard this from a lot, a lot of students. <laughs> you maybe, some of you. <laughs> but, this is what got me, I don't know why, he has bad acne. Is <laughs> 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 that strange? I thought that was, everything else was like, hey, I'm kidding. Why? Pick on me. <clears throat> you couldn't do it. Huh. I came in the factory boy this morning, and the next day I came in and I found this man. I had to find who this terrible man was. <laughs> <laughs> that's what started off. I think we ought to hear from James that's and pretty true. Moore. That's pretty much true. Completely disruptive. <laughs> now you tell the story again. I still have that book called Sell It to Anybody for a Hundred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Red. Mine has never been open. <laughs> <laughs> we believe that. <laughs> Oh, where can we go from here? <laughs> why don't we go to travel? Travel, because you're at travel. Oh, that's right. But you can say anything you want. The three of us went to Europe in 1956. The three uh, of us being Morton, Raymond, and me. And we had Tracy a. Tracy Spooner's in a piano. I was the short person in this little Volkswagen which was littler than it is, than it is now. And uh, we fought all over Europe for <laughs> June to September or August. We saw everything. We climbed to the top of every Gothic cathedral in Europe. <laughs> and of course, I would give anything that had means like that. <laughs> but, uh, I think the, uh, there are a lot of icons, but if you would 
describe our lunch with Corbu. Well, the lunch with Corbu. We bought that out. Lunch with Corbu. I forgot about him. He's a great architect. <laughs> we had heard that Corbusier spent the summers near Monte Carlo in a little cabin he had, and um, we researched it. Somebody told us, I guess, that there was a restaurant. Your aunt. It could have been my aunt, yeah. I had a very wealthy aunt who spent every summer in Monte Carlo, and it was probably the only decent meal we had in three months uh, with, with them. But anyway, we went into this little restaurant, and uh, sure enough, Carbu was there. Uh, oh, he had his la a lady friend with him, and so we really couldn't interact with him, but we did find him. But we did see on that trip Ronchamp, we saw the Swiss Pavilion, we saw the, uh, uh, what's the one? The, I'm trying to think of the one in, in Paris, the uh, Salvation, Army. Salvation Army building and the, the project in Marseille where we got up on the roof and all of that. And, uh, we, it, it was an unbelievable opportunity and we had visited uh, Dudok who was still living if you remember in, um, in uh, Hilversum um, we stayed in the dormitory in uh, the University of London which somebody touted was a really good place to stay we didn't realize it hadn't been repaired from World War II and it had big <laughs> buttresses on the side to keep it from falling down and, and, the, and the floors weren't level and uh, there was the time that I ran into a, uh, I was driving and I ran into an Italian when we were driving through the Alps. <laughs> and um, he was very irritated but spoke no English. <laughs> and I'll never know whatever happened after that. <laughs> but, um, it was very. It was a great experience because after having spent five years at Rice, and and, and a, in those days a really pretty good education in the history of art and architecture, uh, to be able to see these things was was really a, a treat. So that's that was the beginning of some travels, and uh, I have been lucky enough to see other things. Uh, I have always been more intrigued about seeing some of the early modern modernist buildings than the latter ones. And uh, that's one of the reasons that Susan and I went on the uh, RDA tour to Paris because my good friend John Kasparian somehow got us into the Villa Savoie on an unbelievably beautiful day with the bright sunshine and a blue sky and uh, it was a great treat. Uh, we had a visiting professor when I attended Rice who had written a book about uh, Macintosh and all my life I had wanted to see the work in Glasgow and it was only I guess in the last five or six years, maybe. When did we go to Glasgow? Maybe 10 years ago, but got to, had called, um, and, and of course, with the internet and all that, called, uh, uh, got in touch with a, a society, a Macintosh society in Glasgow, and called this lady who was the executive director, and. I had remembered the name of the guy, it was it, Horth, who had written that book about uh, Macintosh, who uh, had been the visiting professor at Rice, and I mentioned his name, and she says, oh, he has given us the building that we are headquartered in, and I said, well, can you arrange a tour for us? And by God, did she ever arrange a tour? We got to see the 
the the art school. We got to see his his apartment, which has been re rebuilt in uh, at the university. There, we got to see the house near Loch Lomond, where the living room is is white and the dining room is black. And I mean, it was a really I have I've really been intrigued and inspired by the early modernists because. Those were the people that really took the risks. It's pretty easy to do it today, maybe not in Houston so much. <laughs> but anyway, I've been very lucky to, to be able to see a lot of things. Next table. Hands. Bill Nyhouse. Bill Nyhouse. Oh, we have to repeat the question. Well, you know, you know, but before we go to the door, you open. <laughs> I've had the luck to work with Raymond at no range for 20, 25 years. What, what, what all of you don't know about Raymond is when we were doing Westbury High School, and we had a woodshop that needed to be built, where do you think the woodshop came from? It was Broxton's. I mean, and, and I don't know how many you built, but I, I know there were more than one. Do you have an idea? Uh, I got really involved with two high schools, mostly. A little bit with Westbury, a little bit with, with Lee, and more than the others uh, with Milby. Use the mic. Um, I have gotten involved mostly with Milby High School because they had a, an instructor who wanted to teach woodwork. He wasn't much of a woodworker, but he was a very good teacher. and. Uh, I agreed to, to help them if they wanted me to, and they did want me to, and I went over to Melby about once every week or two and talked to the kids and agreed to hire them, in the, some of them in the summer as, as, a, as a sort of interns. And you know, what's interesting, to this very day, uh, there are probably a half dozen of our key people, our key people out in the shop, who came out of that Melby program because you have got to continue to encourage the younger people to do the things that we think are important to be done. They're going to be done in a different way, but it's, it's important. You really want to go yeah. through that door? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, you know, we've got the best and we've got the worst. What can I say? Um, we, we have been a very enlightened place at times and, and not so enlightened at other times. And, and I got to say, since you opened the door, it's time that architects took back architecture. We, we, don't, we don't control our destiny and we ought to. Uh, the, the construction managers control it, the developers control it, the contractors control it, the real estate brokers control it, we are we are almost an asterisk in the in the in, in building buildings and it and it shouldn't be that way in in my opinion uh, i remember years ago you never saw an article in the paper in the newspaper announcing a building that didn't mention the name of the architect it was always in there and now it's never in there and, and I think that's a travesty. And I think it's a travesty that, that uh, architects are, are cut out of uh, a good bit of the, the building process. I mean, 
some of the the best some of the top architects I have talked to at times get into these projects where uh, the construction management group don't let them get involved in the selection of subcontractors. They don't get them, let them see the, the, the numbers of the bids, the, the subcontractors' bids, or anything. It, and who, who is better than the architects to de determine or at least help determine where the money ought to be spent. I, I am really damn concerned about the future of this profession if we can't take it back. We need to do that, and we need to figure out how to do it, and um, I think the younger guys here, the younger women and men and women here uh, are the ones that are going to have to do this because we're the ones that let it go. <laughs> and uh, I know I'm kind of getting up on my my uh, pulpit here to preach, but I really am bothered by what has happened to our profession, and I think it isn't. And we're not getting the kind of buildings we we deserve. And. Uh, as we all know, most of the buildings that are built here are not designed by architects anyway. Uh, they're not designed, <laughs> the truth be known. Um, they're just boxes with uh, decorations thrown on them, which I guess is an easy way to do it. But good design is not easy. It's never been easy. It's never going to be easy. It's a very, very demanding task, and uh, I respect that. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that I don't curse some of you sometimes, because I do. <laughs> <laughs> and architecture has gotten very complex, because when we were in school, you didn't have to worry about uh, sustainability, and you didn't have to worry about handicapped access, and you didn't have to worry about God knows what but today, it's very complex, and so, and so consequently, architects can't know every trade uh, to the extent they used to. And so some of us who have taken the alternative um, uh, have, have done, done an alternative uh, career, such as myself, um, I remember when I left Dunaway and Jones to to go work for my father to see if if uh, that was something I really wanted to do, and um, it was a it was a traumatic experience because in at that time architects were expected to be architects and not be contractors and not be subcontractors and not be in anything other than pure what was called considered architecture and I had been a member of the AIA and um, I was told that if I was going to work for my family's firm that I could be an associate member but I could never become a corporate member because I wasn't an architect and Anyway, long story short, I figured out that what I was doing was architecture in a different way, and it was probably a lot better for the profession for me to be in the woodwork business <laughs> and a lot better for me. But um, to interact with, with, with people like Richard Meyer and some of these, other, and, and Charlie Guathney and some of them, and be able to work out the, the problems that you encounter is a type of architecture. It's a part of architecture anyway. And I think that it's healthier. And, and I, I got to say, I never in my wildest dreams imagined I would ever be, uh, have, be able to use AIA after my name, much less FAIA. I mean, it was the biggest surprise to me that, that I ever experienced. But um, I think that 
that the, one of the good things is we are educating architects more broadly and the more broadly we educate them, the better off we may be because we'll get people maybe in some of these other disciplines such as construction management and, and construction. We already have and we already do. And maybe that's a way to get architecture back. Well, I think what what we've lost is 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 our stature, our position in the the hierarchy of, of building. I mean, when 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 I started, when we started, James and Martin and I, uh, the architect was the person. That was the person that that you you had to be damn sure that whatever you were going to do, if you were a contractor or a subcontractor or an engineer or what, the architect was the boss. The architect was the guy running the show. And that was the person that made the significant decisions or, or was certainly involved in them. I think we've lost a lot of that. We, we lost it maybe because we just didn't think about what we were letting go of. And, and then we had the maturity of construction management and uh, contracting where the, the risk has, in, in the early days when we started, it wasn't uncommon to see contractors who got into financial trouble and, and didn't survive. I mean, you could go broke being a contractor. You can't today very easily. You got to really be stupid, uh, because you have no. I know I kind of get carried away, but but the, the the construction industry has no risk anymore. It has zero risk. If you look at a construction contract. Um, there is everything that is a risk is laid off on somebody else. The subcontractors, or the engineers, or the architects, or the owner, but the contractor has almost zero risk. And so you're dealing with somebody with zero risk, they're not gonna let anybody spoil the, the, the pie, so to speak. Uh, but on the other hand, we have gained, I think the computer has helped us um, gain in that we have been able to standardize how we do things a lot better. Uh, when, when James and Martin and I started out, you know, we were still drawing with pencils and T-squares and parallel bars and triangles and whatever. and you had a wide variety of standards. Every, every firm had its standard, but unfortunately every firm's standard was different from every other firm. And you could get sets of drawings that are vastly different. Today, there is more, uh, a, a certain unity to, to, the, to the documentation and, and that sort of thing. The downside, and some, sometimes the downside of the computer is that it's so easy to, to put something in the library and pull it out and not think about the detail and what it is. And we get frequently drawings of, of stuff that we know doesn't work and we feel like we're obligated to ask questions. So I think that that part of it is getting better. I think that if, but I, I think the decision making is what we have to, we have to gain, gain back. Which table still has yet to ask a question? Finish the answer. Finish the answer? Tell us how we get it back. Uh, I don't think it's we easy to say we can get it back. My question is how do we do it? 
well, how you do anything, well, it may, co it may cost more, but no, it, it, part of it, is, it, part of it in my view is politics. I, I mean, I'm involved in stuff out here at Rice and I've been able to see some things happen that people didn't think could happen on this campus. And I just, as a mean son of a bitch, is how I've gotten my way. <laughs> I mean, I'm just the kind of person, I've gotten to be the kind of person, if it isn't right, I'm gonna complain about it. And I've been able to get myself in a position where um, if I don't like it, I might be going to the president of the university and telling him. And I have. Keep it up. I'm, I'm on the Rice Building Committee, much to the dismay of the facilities folks here. Um, but, yes. I have a question. Go ahead. All it took was money. <laughs> well, it, it was partly, we have a building committee that only has one half-ass architect on it, and that's me. And all the rest of the people are either engineers or laymen and uh, lawyers and accountants and investors and people that made a lot of money, but you can't buy taste, I found out. Um, I, uh, I'm probably be in a lot of trouble, but I'm, I'm at a stage of life where I don't give a damn. Um, my boss is my daughter, and if she doesn't like it, so it, so it goes. She's not here. Um, I, I did recommend, as, as, as an example, we'll talk about this building. Uh, I did recommend that the building, the facilities people interview Tom Pfeiffer. Uh, because I had known Tom when he was working for Richard Meyer and had interacted with him and, and I liked him and I thought he was a good architect. And I said, you know, it, this guy I, I believed was on the cusp of, of becoming a really well-known architect and I thought that they ought to interview him. And so they did and he came down and he showed what he was doing and so forth. And um, the, what they interviewed him for, he didn't get. But they did, they did kind of remember him. And the president of the university, David Liebren, wanted this facility. And he said, the Foundern Library looks like a tomb at night. It, you know, it's got small windows and it's dark and it's not inviting and the middle of the campus is just very dark and it looks like it's dead. And I think that if we have, and this thing started out as a coffee shop that was within the Foundry Library, but it, it's evolved a lot. And, and uh, so he started talking about this building and he said, it ought to be a beacon. It ought to be, uh, it ought to really be a place where you can see activity. And so the truth of the matter is, if, if the president of the university hadn't have said that and hadn't have taken that approach, uh, it probably wouldn't have happened. And so the, they remembered that Tom had, had designed some very open, airy buildings so in any event, they had him back down here to talk about designing this building, and much to my 
amazement, the building committee voted to award him this uh, commission. And so I can't really take credit for it because the, the committee basically uh, agreed to hire him. I was on the committee, but <laughs> I was on the committee, but um, I didn't really, uh, and I wanted them to, to hire Tom, but I, I didn't really overtly push it uh, because you can't. Uh, I'm, I am absolutely certain that the majority of the people on that building committee had no inkling what they had approved. <laughs> Well, I'm serious. And, and so, uh, you don't have to lie and have subterfuge. All you have to do is just show them what you want to do. They can't understand it anyway. So here we are. And so, uh, we ended up with this building, and the president likes it. And the faculty likes it, and the administration AI likes it. AI what? The the National AI got it, gave it uh, a ASLA. National ASLA. Honor Award, and ASLA. recently the Landscape Architects Association, which is their AI, gave it. Uh, they had 218 building, uh, 218 landscape projects submitted for their award, of which there were seven, and this was one of the 218 selected worldwide. And the students love it. And the students, students like it, it, I understand, and I like it. And we all, um, we all love it. I, I have a question about it, actually. Us, you know, one of the things people bring up sometimes, um, I, we hosted a group of, of out-of-town architects last weekend, and uh, there's really not a stick of wood in this building. I mean, there's some millwork, yes. And so people ask that question, did, did that ever come up during the design process? It never did, came up, and, in, and I'm living in a house that has no wood in it either. <laughs> I have one one piece of natural wood in the house that that Andy and I and and Bill Canada designed, and it's the the oak handrail on the stair, and that probably should have been white too. <laughs> yeah, could. Well, we built that. It's an old house. We we've been in it what. 37 years, and, uh, oh, okay, Susan wants me to talk about Sally Walsh. We bought a painting, the, the house has, we decided, because I was poor at the time, that we needed uh, few, few, as few rooms as we could manage, and so, and, and, and so we have. We were definitely on a budget, and we were told that corners were the most expensive, so we have four. <laughs> The, 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 the house <laughs> the house is is really just a rectilinear box it really is it, it is an absolute rectangle um, and who uh, who designed the house is is Bill Kennedy and Andy Todd and I together and uh, Well, no, no, it, it, it couldn't have happened uh, any other way because I had been working on trying to get a house built and, and I was working at the company and I, I was traveling almost every other week and 
I kept working on it, and Andy and I would have lunch, and Andy said, you know, at the rate you're going, you're never going to get it built. And I've been working with a young, in those days, young, <laughs> um, architect who was on the faculty, Bill Kennedy. Why don't you let us get into this thing with you and get it done? And I said, fine. And Bill claims we, we designed the house on a napkin at Alfred's Delicatessen. <laughs> Yeah, but you could take a napkin and do that any time, Bill, and I wouldn't put it past you. These napkins have, there were three of us, and we were drawing over and out in the village, and, and we were spilling matzo balls all over, and we were It is really the dimensions of the shoebox, because that was that was what Bill found was easy to make. If we had to do a model, we could just make a shoebox and cut open. <laughs> 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 the question was, you need an for your father to get up and make his annual birthday addresses. And, and we, we decided that the length of the room had to be the same as the faculty club, which was six bays at 12 feet, which is 72 feet. And so we came up with that dimension because we knew what the faculty club was. The architecture is really right. It's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'll tell you some stuff. I'll tell you in essence, and we came from a little builder's house in Maryland, and of course we had a lot of rooms, and, and Susan unfortunately has, had, has had to live over 50 years with an architect who's driving her crazy and who's, who, whose approach to buying furniture is you first buy a chair if it really looks good, and if it's comfortable, that's an extra bonus. <laughs> But we have one room, living room, dining room, family room, whatever you want to call it, that is 72 feet long with a 20-foot ceiling with a glass wall and looks out on, onto a ravine. And it, I, still, I still feel a certain tranquility being in that space. And Andy Todd drew a sketch of what that room was going to look like, I'll never forget it, I still have it, sitting in one corner looking down, and it's almost like a photograph, it's that accurate. Bill, I had, Bill, Bill's, I, Bill came up with the idea of going to a, to a two-floor scheme, which I had not, and that's what has really made it a great space for us to live in. And then there was the day when these two guys come to me with this sheepish look and say, because we were going to do it out of brick. And uh, I didn't want wood because I didn't want to maintain it. I mean, you know, you make your living doing wood and then you don't want to use it. But uh, So they said, they said, what do you think about white stucco? No, no. <laughs> what, what do you think about stucco? <laughs> uh, anyway, and and you know what we did? We just plopped the house down on this two thirds of an acre, heavily wooded. We don't have any grass. Didn't have any grass. Never have any grass. Don't own a lawnmower. Never owned a lawnmower. And the trees shed their leaves and, and provide mulch and weeds don't grow. And the back part of the lot has never been touched in probably 80 or 100 years because we haven't, land, quote, landscaped it. We've just left it natural. And it's been a wonderful place for us. And if we were to build another house, we'd probably build the same dead gum house. <laughs> oh, the window, Andy wants. <laughs> Well, I, and I'll take, and, and, and I gotta say, the builder, and, and I was traveling a lot, and the house is under construction, and 
Um, I know, no, no, I know, but I'm, I'm. This is a prelude to that, and there was, we didn't, we didn't evidently have as good of drawings as we thought we did, and the contractor had some question about the fascia around the top, and uh, so he called Bill and I to talk about it. We told him what we thought was the solution, and it would have changed the dimension of the fascia slightly from one end to the other, which was not a good thing. But anyway, so they start working on it. I go out of town, I come back, and they had the deck on when I left, and I came back and the deck is off. And I said, what the heck is going on here? And they said, well, uh, we took the deck up. And I said, why? Well, Mr. Todd told us to. I said, well, is this going to be an extra? Yeah, it's going to be an extra. I said, is Mr. Todd going to pay for it? No, he's not going to pay for it. And uh, so Andy corrected it, and, and, it, and, it, and he, was absolutely, he was absolutely correct. He, what, he, what, what he did should have been done, and Bill and I did an expedient thing, and that's the other thing about good design. It's rarely expedient. Probably never. He was in a day. Oh, Susan wanted me to talk about it. The, the insight into Sally Walsh, and we buy this, this uh, Arnaldi, it's not a, it's painting, but it's, it's thick wood, it's about three inches thick, and he did it with a chainsaw, and I mean, but it's a wonderful piece, and heavy, and big, it's about, I don't know, seven feet across, and eight feet high, and we had these big end walls, and so that's where we were going to put it. And I called Sally, and I said, this is what I bought. And she looked at it, and she said, that's good. And I said, when it comes, uh, would you would you, you want to come out and take a look and see where you think we ought to put it? And, yeah, I'll do that. And we agreed we'd do it on the end wall. And she said, but it's got to be at the right height. And so she's ill at the time. She, she was not in good health. And... So I have four guys from a shop come, because these are heavy pieces, and where do you want it? And you're having to hold this, this thing, and Sally's sitting on the sofa, and she's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, no, no, down, no, no. okay, is that it? No, up about a half an inch, okay, is that right? No, I'll go down about a quarter. Is that right? That's it. Okay. Mark it. Mark it. And we had these big cleats that, that it sits on, and so we put the cleats on, and we get this thing, and we hang it. And she's sitting there, and she's looking at it, and she's saying, No. <laughs> I think it could go up an inch. And I said, I hope you live that long. <laughs> And, and that's where it is today. And, and uh, but Sally was a Sally was a perfectionist, and she was and she always spoke her mind. And uh, I remember uh, Susan and I going up to see her at MD Anderson when she was really ill. And it was actually the day the afternoon uh, she had she she passed away the the evening after the afternoon we went up there. And I had on this shirt that I liked, but it was really garish. And uh, my taste is better than it used to be, but it used to be pretty bad. <laughs> um, and, she's, and she's sitting up there, and she's looking at me, and I didn't know whether she could speak. And she said, that shirt is hideous. <laughs> And I, and, and I really, I believe that that was probably the last word that she spoke. Raymond. Yes. This is a little, something for you and for Sally. Uh, I don't know if you remember when I built my house, you called me 
one Sunday morning. I did. Very early. Yes. Well, it wasn't very early for me. <laughs> it was 10 o'clock in the morning. For me on Sunday, that is very early. And he, you said to me, I want to bring Sally over to see your house. Right. Sally was, was really had declined at that yeah, point. Yes, and, uh, uh, and I'll never forget, he, she, I said, he said, when? And he said, well, in about a half an hour. I said, okay. Uh, so, I mean, I had to get up, I had to make the bed, I had to get everything ready, I had half an hour. And uh, and Raymond and Sally arrived, and I, I think I, gosh, I had only lived in the house maybe six months, and uh, these were two people who were very, very important to me. And uh, I'll never forget Raymond bringing Sally in because he was proud of it, and actually this is the reason I'm telling the story is that uh, and they saw the house, and, and Sally, it was really shortly before she died, Raymond wanted her to see the house. And I think she was even too weak to go upstairs, as I recall, and we sat in my living room and we talked. And, uh, th these were two people who meant a great deal to me. I was a young art, youngish architect at the time. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Way young. Yeah. 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 It was 19 years ago, so. Okay. Um, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> But these were two people who had encouraged me and nurtured me. Uh, I came to Houston, I didn't know anybody. In fact, I worked at uh, Morris, it was then Morris Architects. And I got to know Sally, and I got to know James, uh, and others, and, and, and through them I got to know Raymond. And uh, as I started my own practice, Raymond was very, very encouraging to me. The segue is Raymond has been encouraging to a lot of us. And uh, I, I don't think my life would personally be the same. Raymond, there, he, you know, it's, it's not at all gratuitous in any way. You have to be, he has to believe in you. And uh, Sally was the same way. And uh, as, as I've gone through my own personal career, it, it's continued that way. And I think there are probably many people in this room who would feel the same way. So I appreciate it, Raymond. And well, I'm so glad you brought Sally well, over and got me up that morning. All I can tell you is, I can summon up really, I care. But I recall uh, uh, the, the dean, who was the guy with CRS that was dean here? Uh, Paul, uh, no, 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 no. Cannon. Paul Cannon. Paul Cannon was dean for a very short time, and I was on the selection committee with Andy when we hired him. And uh, I remember talking to Paul and saying, Paul, uh, what do you look for in a student? I mean, what do you look for in an architect? Uh, how, do you, how do you know who's gonna make it and who's not gonna make it? And he said, I'll never forget, he said, look, Intelligence is important, talent is important, uh, but there is something that is, that, is, that is more important than anything, and that is I want people who are passionate about architecture. And architects are who, if I, if I have any measure of success, it's been the architectural profession and architects who have helped me achieve whatever it is I've, I've been able to do. And so, all I can tell you in closing, if we are closing, and it's, we, we should, is I thank you. You don't need to thank me, because I've gotten a heck of a lot more from you guys than you ever are going to get from me. 